Morning, church fam. Good to see you guys. Glad to be here to kick off a new sermon series that we are going to call Margin. If this is your first time here, I want to say welcome to our church family. Uh, My name is Rick, and I preach here on Sunday mornings. And like I said, if this is your first time here, we'd love to know that you're with us this morning. And if you haven't done so yet, we would love for you to take the connection card on the chair in front of you, take it, fill it out, take it to our welcome center after service, uh, and connect with one of our teammates. And we have a gift that we will give you as our way of saying thanks for being here, thanks for hanging out with us today, uh, and we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, One of the things that we offer here is a four-week workshop called Starting Point. And so after you attend here for for a few Sundays, if uh, this seems like the church for you where you'd like to get plugged in a little bit better, or even just learn a little bit more... Um, We're going to be kicking that back up. We took a July break, but we're going to be kicking that back up in August. You can join online. If you download the app called the Church Center app, you find our church called Severn Christian Church, and you log in and create some information, you'll be able to join that group um, right there in the group's app. So we really encourage you to do that. It is a great way to get connected with the church and find out a little, more, a little bit more about us. Uh, but like I said, this is uh, the first sermon that we're going to do in our sermon series <clears throat> called Margin. And I don't know about you guys, but as a parent, especially as a parent, I mean, I have found myself just at flat out exhaustion, especially after a week like VBS. Can I get an amen, parents? Amen. But VBS was awesome. My kids had an awesome experience. My daughter got her first memory verse that she's ever gotten. And yeah, I kind of feel a little bit bad as a dad, like maybe I haven't been working with her enough or giving her enough uh, of a chance. But she came to me and told me her memory verse, and I couldn't believe it. It was really, really awesome. She's five, and, uh, and it, was, it was really cool. And they kept asking to go back to VBS, dancing, singing, eating snacks. Knox would not stop talking about Uncle Clyde and Aunt Judy, who he's desperate to go spend time with and play trains. He goes, Dad, Clyde loves me. And he wants to play trains with me. I'll take the red train. He can have the green train. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Clyde's another staff member here. And uh, they watched our kids when they were younger. And so they have a great relationship. But it was a really, really fun week. But man, after VBS, I mean, you're just tired, especially like, I don't know about you guys, but, but week, uh, or, or night four, yeah, week four, night four, really kind of like, that's when I start going down the hill. And I'm like, two more days, two more days. <laughs> you're just tired. But that's the way it is with life too. Like, If you've lived in American culture for any amount of time, you will know that efficiency and progress and technology and getting the most bang uh, out of the least amount of buck is kind of like our mojo. That's, That's our style of living. We want things to be the greatest for the least amount of effort as possible. But the problem that we find ourselves in is even though we have technology, which gives us more time, we really fill up that time with other things. In fact, what technology has done is it's really created this expectation in our life that because we are so efficient and we can get things done so fast and so well and so excellent that we fill up all of that new space with just more stuff. We got to get our TV shows watched in. You know what I mean? We got to make sure we get our certain amount of exercise in, or we got to get our reading in. If we can't get our reading in at this time, then we'll do an audio book. So that way, when we're driving, we're capitalizing on the most amount of time that we're given throughout the day. I mean, it is just constant, constant performance and, uh, and efficiency and expediency. We're distracted people. Let's admit it. We are infatuated with entertainment. If we are not on our cell phones, I remember when I got my first smartphone. Do you guys remember that? I told myself, I'll never be bored again. I remember telling myself that. And that was not the truth. I got bored after that. Why? Because we live in a culture. I have the spiritual sickness of hurriedness. So if we're not on our phones and social media, we're watching a movie or we're tuned into a Netflix show or we're just always entertained. We've always got to be doing something and we don't rest. If we're not watching football, then we're doing a project. If we're not running the kids to their sports programs, we have to find something that they can be interested in. I mean, we not only want food, we want it fast. We have clocks stationed in McDonald's that say average serving time, 45 seconds. And if we sit in the fast food line for over a minute, we're like, what is going on? What is wrong with these people? Of course, you don't have that experience at Chick-fil-A. I'm just saying. We live by the adage, time is money. We find ourselves obsessing over things that are convenient and time, and we have less and less of time. It's the tyranny of living urgency, of living lives that are urgent. It drives us. We're obsessed with it. We got to multitask. 
In fact, one of the job descriptions that you'll find on most job descriptions is the ability to multitask. Why? We want the most effective person possible. You've got to be able to get a bunch of stuff done, even though you're only one person. And of course, with bottom lines and performances and getting the most bang for the least amount of buck, this overflows into the church. What is the least amount that I can do to get the highest effectiveness for my Christianity? Go to church for, for Sunday, like one hour, and I get saved? Man, that's, that's a pretty good deal. I, I think I've been for that. And that's how we view church and Jesus and what our relationship with God looks like. How short can we make Sunday morning service? How effective can we make it to get the job done? And it's unfortunate, but it happens. You know, the great poet John Milton, he gave us this phrase, when I consider how my light is spent. It's this beautiful phrase, this poetic phrase that really is our light, our life, the things that we do, the people that we are, how we spend our time. And he wrote those words as he was going blind. He looked back on his life and he pondered this, how his time, his light, so to speak, while he had it. How do we spend our time? You know, I think most of us in America, most of us as American Christians, we spend our time like this. We sit at traffic lights. For like six months out of our life, we're sitting at traffic lights. Eight months, we're opening junk mail, whether that's email or actually junk mail that we get through the mail still. We spend one year searching through desk clutter. Isn't that ridiculous? Where did I put that? I am always looking for my keys, so this is definitely me. We spend two years trying to call people who are not available or even text them. Now, I'm guilty of this. So if you've been in church and worked with me any amount of time, you'll know this is my special, special power. I will mentally respond to someone, but not actually respond to someone. Does that ever happen to you? Yeah, it happens to me. You're getting some amens there. We spend three years of our life in meetings, five years waiting in line, and every single day, the average American will commute for 45 minutes on average. That's a lot of time. We will be interrupted 73 times. We will receive 600 advertising messages a day. I mean, 600 different messages a day. You want to talk about something that's competing for your mind and your thoughts and your time? This is totally it. We watch four hours of television on average. Four hours of television. I mean, that's a crazy amount of time. I don't even want to give you the statistics about playing video games, but that's how it is. You know, the average working parent spends twice as much time dealing with email than they do playing, uh, playing with their children. It's crazy. We are so jam-packed full of busyness that we have no room to become the person that we talked about over the last seven weeks. Over the last seven weeks, we looked at DNA of the local church, the kind of person that God is calling us to be, the kind of church that God is calling us to be, and we have found ourselves with this wonderful expectation but with little to no time to actually do it. We have to have time in order to pursue greatness. And if we're not willing to create margin in our lives, we'll never be able to give God room so that he can move however he wants to move in our lives. In his book, The Praise of Slowness, Carl Honro tells of a book titled One Minute Bedtime Stories. And here's how they came to be. Here's what he writes. They came to be like this, to help parents deal with the time-consuming tots, various, various authors have condensed classic fairy tales into 60-second sound bites. Let me give them this fairy tale in 60 seconds so I can get out of here. And I would be lying to you if I didn't say that that actually sounds appealing to me. I'm going on Amazon after this, 60-second fairy tale bedtime stories to read to my kids. Because look, parenting is exhausting and you're doing it all the time. You never get a break hardly unless Uncle Clyde <coughs> and Aunt Judy take your kids away for a weekend. But it's, it, it is. That's how, that's how our culture is. What can I do to get the job done with the least amount of work possible? But here's the reality. If God is in the transforming business, which he is, but our minds are constantly distracted with the spiritual sickness of hurriedness, we are obligated to create margin in our lives and make room for God to, to, to move and to work. Now, when we look to the life of Jesus, he is our example. He is our model. And let me tell you something. The man relentlessly, God himself in human form, relentlessly created margin as the son so that he could connect with the father. The goal of the Christian life is to be like Jesus, is it not? And so if we want to be like Jesus, we have to not only think what he thought, but do what he did. You know, even from Jesus' early life as a child, he was always making time for God. I mean, imagine being a teenager, going on a trip, a vacation with your kids, and then on your way home, so it's a big family vacation, on your way home, you're like, dude, where's Rick? 
Where's my son? Where's my, where's my daughter? And you travel back to where you came from, and you spent days looking for them to find out they were actually in church the entire time, learning about God through the Bible, attending Bible class. They were like a week-long VBS. Wouldn't that be crazy? That's, that's Jesus. Even from early, t- early times, like a teenager, he was making room for God to work in his life. Look what Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 46 says. So after the Passover, his family goes and they celebrate this Passover in Jerusalem. And on their way home, uh, a couple days passed. They just thought that Jesus was, you know, with uh, his other extended family members. And all of a sudden, they're like, we can't find Jesus. And so they travel back to Jerusalem. And it says they spent a couple days looking for him. And here's what it says. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Parents, wouldn't that be amazing if you didn't have to wonder about your kids because they were just always consumed with Jesus? Like, that's like the epitome, like, of parenthood, right? You don't have a care or a worry in the world, even though that's not how it is, because if your kids were anything like me as a teenager, you're probably in constant fear and anxiety. But, I mean, Jesus is like, this is my life. I'm making room for God. I want to hear his voice. I want to see his face. I want to live the life that he wants me to live. And what happened as a result of him creating margin with God? Look what it says in verse 50. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and man. You know, when Jesus' ministry was kicked off, he spent 40 days praying and fasting. 40 days! We can't even find four minutes, four hours, four days to give God time uh, to work and, and make room for him to work in our lives. But Jesus, God himself... Took 40 days to say, look, I need to connect with God. I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast before I go into ministry. And why did Jesus fast? Well, he gives us the answer. Look, we don't fast so that we can feel better about ourselves or so that we can say, hey, look, not only can I connect with God, but I can drop five pounds in the process. It's like a double whammy here. No, that's not why we fast. We don't fast to get the approval of men. We fast so that we can make room for God, so that we can see his face. Look what Jesus wrote in Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. It says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then they will fast. Jesus says, Look, my disciples aren't fasting because I'm here. I'm with them, but there is coming a day when they will fast. Because I won't be with them any longer. My, my earthly ministry will be done. And that's why we fast. That's why we do that spiritual practice. So that we can behold the face of God. So that we can make room for God to work in our lives. Now, I have fasted before, and it's not easy. I've done uh, partial day fasts. I've done fasts from certain things. I think those are good places to start. I've done full day fasts, and I have the worst I've ever done, the hardest I've ever done, were three day fasts. And those were times of intense, really just issues in my life that I could not get through or I I couldn't have a resolution to. But fasting helps us see the face of God. Now, if our lives are constantly consumed with our next meal and what we're going to eat and always wanting something to, you know, a snack to, to eat, we'll never have that opportunity to let God make us aware of things that otherwise we wouldn't be aware of. And that's the point. Making room for God. Jesus, again, during his ministry, he prioritized a prayer life. He made sure to make room for God after ministering to people, before ministering to people. Look what it says in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And the disciples wake up and like, where's Jesus? They go look for him. And then he goes and he preaches to the next town, making sure to make room for God. Now, if we're going to live like Jesus, we have to think what Jesus thought and do what Jesus did. If we want to become the person that we discussed over the last seven weeks, we have to give God a chance to move in our life. And we cannot do that as long as we are sick with the spiritual sickness of hurriedness. Jesus prioritized prayer. It says in Luke chapter 15, or chapter 5, verse 15, it says, But now even more, the report about him when he went abroad, because he's healing people, and great crowds gathered near him, and he healed their infirmities. And it says in verse 16, But he would withdraw to a desolate place and pray. He didn't go away from everyone. He took time. He set apart time to connect with God through prayer. And there are dozens of examples that I've listed up here for you. I mean, he's feeding people and he's praying. 
He's serving the 12 disciples, and then he's retreating to the mountain of transfiguration. Uh, He is, even before he died on the cross, before he was crucified, you found Jesus making room and time for God to move. And he wanted God to guide him to make the decision that was best as possible in his human flesh. And there he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, not my will, but yours be done. God, I want you to move. Over and over again, Jesus was making room for God. He was creating margin. And I want to suggest to you this morning and over the next few weeks as we go through thoughts and talents and treasure and time and testimony that we take these opportunities to make room for God to work in our life, whether it's with our time or in our mind as we're discussing this morning or with our money or with our traditions, whatever it is, we have to give God a chance to move if we want to be like Jesus. So time and time again, we're seeing Jesus creating room for God to move. And if God is in the transforming business, which he is, but our minds are constantly distracted with the spiritual sickness of hurriedness, which more likely than not it is, we must create margin and make room for God to work. And so what's the problem? Well, it's what I've said, the spiritual sickness of hurriedness. You always have to be doing something. It's this inner attitude. And here's how you know that you got spiritual sickness of hurriedness. Top three signs. You ready? You're bored. You're bored. Boredom is an indication that you're sick. You're impatient. Waiting in a fast food line. Somebody hasn't texted or phone called you back and you just grow impatient. Outbursts of anger. Those are indications that you are spiritually sick with hurriedness. It's, it's the lack of being able to take in the moment. It's like I was reading a story this week um, about somebody speaking about spiritual sickness and hurriedness, and he said that he took his son out, and they would do, you know, father-son time, daddy-daughter time. Well, he was out with his son. They went to sit down and have ice cream because they were getting ready to go to a concert, and they had 15 minutes, and so there was an ice cream shop right outside of where the concert hall was, and he sits down with his son, and uh, his son just eats that ice cream, you know, just a kid, super, like, excited about the, the concert. He's ready to go and move on and do something else and just wants to go on to the next thing. And uh, he scoops down his ice cream in literally a few minutes. And he says, uh, his son was like, all right, Dad, I'm, I'm bored. Let's, let's, let's go on and do something different. Let's go, let's go find something else out. And his dad said, no, we're, we're going to stay right here. We're going to enjoy this moment. Oh, Dad, I, I don't want to do that. I mean, I, I want to I go. I want to go. Parents, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Your kids just want to go do the next thing. And he said, son, I want you to notice five things in this ice cream shop that you've never noticed before. Okay, well, I, I never noticed that, that painting on the wall, and I never noticed that light fixture, and he pointed out five things, and he was like, good job, son, I'm proud of you, we can go now, and then the son began to enjoy the time, and he wasn't ready to hurry and move on, and that's the same thing it is with us, the, the sickness is hurriedness, the bigger issue is the failure to live in the moment, just moving on from one thing to the next, and when we talk about the really important things in life, like our kids, or our church, or our spouses, or even ourself, are we really willing to sacrifice the great things for the good things? Well, I sure hope not. Did you know that a clock was invented by a, uh, the, the clock, the clock as we know it, was invented by a, a Christian monk? Pretty cool, right? I mean, out of all people to invent a clock, I mean, come on, folks, all right? He must have had plenty of time on his hands. Did you get that one? Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> I can't claim that one for myself, but if it's a dad joke, dad jokes are shareable, right? But um, he, invented, he invented the clock. And one of the reasons why they want, wanted to invent the clock is because they wanted to regulate their times of prayer and labor. St. Benedict, he wrote in the 6th century, he included these words, Idleness is the enemy of the soul. Therefore, all the community must be occupied at definite times in manual labor and other times at what they called Lectio Divina. It's this, I want to share it with you one Sunday, but it's this beautiful spiritual practice where you're not just reading the Bible, but you're opening up the Bible, you're picking a passage of scripture. You can go check it out on your own or you can wait till I eventually share it with you. But it's where you basically just kind of meditate on the words. So you'll read the passage through one time and then you'll go back down through it. So for instance, if you picked like 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, where it starts off, love is patient, love is kind. And what you'll do is you'll pause on love is patient. And you'll just meditate on that phrase. Well, if God is love, God is patient. If patience is standing up under the weight, God is patient, God is love. And you go through this meditative, reflective practice, 
And let me tell you something, guys. I try this, and I am like thinking about things a million times. You just, you, your mind just constantly bounces, and it's like working out. It's like learning a skill and learning a job. I mean, you are focusing your mind and trying to pay attention for five minutes, not allowing other ideas to come into your mind. And so other guys have recommended, okay, if an idea pops in your mind that you need to pay attention to, just write it down and move that thought out of your mind. Love is patient. Love is kind. God is love. God is kind. God loves me. He cares for me. And it's this, it's this tough spiritual discipline. But these monks, they wanted to focus in on this. They thought, look, idleness is the enemy of the soul. It's how you lose the game that we call life. And so you should either be working or you should be praying. And so each day, a monk would oversee the clock. And any time they were supposed to move on to a different thing, you know, they would uh, ring a loud bell or bang a loud gong and they would move on to their next activity. And this idea that idleness is the enemy of the soul, it was the pervasive thought in, in the monasteries. And so they began to adopt this ritualistic time where they would oversee their prayer times and their work time. But here's the thing. They would at times spend four to five hours in prayer and Bible study. Think about that. I mean, I preach for about 40 minutes. If you look at actually some larger churches in America, like Rick Warren, for instance, he preaches for over an hour. Like that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good amount of time to deliver a sermon. When you talk about the entire church experience showing up to leaving, I mean, for us, if, man, we can't have an express blessed, get it done, you know, in an hour and out, then we're like, man, I, I'm, I'm ready to get out of church. I've been there. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be in your shoes. The last church that I worked at, they had an early morning service at 8 o'clock in the morning. It was so early. We called it the get her done service. You know what I'm saying? You got in, you got her done, and then you got out because that's kind of how the service was structured. But think about this. We are so impatient. It's because we have the spiritual sickness of hurriedness. That's the issue. And so they would spend four to five hours in prayer. And here's the thing. What did the clock eventually do? It shifted to the point where we have to fill up every single hour of the day, but we do it with hurriedness rather than intentional times to give God an opportunity to move. They spent four hours a day just in prayer and Bible reading saying, God, I'm here. I'm showing up. If you want to do something today, great. I'm here to listen. If not, that's okay, but I'm going to give you a chance to move. Imagine for a moment if we were to do that with our time, we were to create a calendar, intentional times of rest, one day a week, one hour a day, one week in a month, one week out of the year. We said, God, I'm creating this time specifically for you. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to sing songs of worship, whatever it is, early in the morning, in the middle of the day, at night. I'm creating this space to give you a chance to move in my mind as I think about you. It would be incredible. We would have a lot of growth with God. Economist Jeremy Rifkin, he's a famous economist, he wrote this. We are so bored today, right? We have technology that has advanced so far, but we have so little time. He says, it is ironic that in a culture so committed to saving time, we feel increasingly deprived of the very thing that we value. Despite our alleged efficiency, we seem to have less time for ourselves and far less time for each other. We have quickened the pace of life only to become less patient. We have become more organized, but less spontaneous, less joyful. I think that's true. We are better prepared to act on the future, but less able to enjoy the present and reflect on the past. Today we have surrounded ourselves with time-saving technology gadgetry only to be overwhelmed by plans that cannot be carried out, appointments that cannot be honored, schedules that cannot be fulfilled, and deadlines that cannot be met. Now, I want us right now to take a step back and look at this big picture. Because if I am your enemy, if I am your enemy, Satan, if I am your enemy, the demonic world, if I am your enemy, the lust of the flesh, and I cannot pull you into sexual sin, and I cannot pull you into greed, and I cannot pull you into power, here's all I'm going to do. Simple. I'm going to try to distract you. That's, that's what I'm going to do. In war, one of the greatest things you could do is place yourself in your enemy's position and ask yourself the question, what would I do if I were him? What moves would I make? And then, once you think like him, then you position yourself to make the best decisions possible so that you can win, right? You do this all the time, whether you're playing a video game or you're in chess, you think like the enemy and then you make a strategy. And if I can't tempt you sexually, 
And if I can't overwhelm you with the uh, love of money, which is greed, and if I can't occupy your mind with power and pursuing um, control, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to neutralize you with distraction. Show up on Sunday, do your thing, go about your life. So we could attend church for 50 years and remain spiritually immature, never making a difference in the kingdom and never growing in our soul, soul growth, which is what we talked about through DNA, becoming the person, the best version of ourselves. Now, if you are the enemy, I'm going to fill up your schedule as much as possible to keep you occupied. You're just too busy to make a difference for God. You're too busy and too distracted. Your mind has such a short attention span, you can't even concentrate on prayer for five minutes. Try it this week. Sit in silence for five minutes. See how you do. I'm telling you, it was a loud wake-up call. When I'm reading this book, for instance, on spiritual disciplines and practices, and I tried to sit down just for five minutes and say, okay, you know, let me give this a shot. I mean, I read my Bible, I study, I prepare sermons, I am an administrator in the church, whatnot. It was difficult. It was challenging. It was hard. That's the enemy's tactic. He's smart. He's not stupid. Sex, sexual sin, yeah, that's a big deal, right? Being a greedy person, yeah, that's a big deal. But being busy, oh, that's a cultural value, right? It means you're working hard. It means you're earning your keep. It means you're growing as a person because you work so hard and you are so busy, you have zero time to rest. Congratulations. I've talked to a couple guys in church, and you know they work secular jobs, and one of the things that's bragged about at happy hour or at a, at a company conference is, man, I put in a 13-hour day yesterday. And thankfully, the wisdom of this guy said, congratulations, you're wasting your life. That's not something to brag about. All you do is work. That's not any good. There's no any life enjoyment in that. I mean, do we really want to look back on our lives and saying, I was so busy, I never lived in the moment. That's not the kind of life that I want to live. That's not the kind of life that God wants us to live. I mean, think about it like this. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through following puts it like this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He is actively working against you. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, so stand firm. He goes on to say in verse 18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints be aware of what is actually going on and if you have found yourself so busy where you have zero time for god it means there's been a scheme at work against you that you've stepped right into that you're not even aware of be alert be aware of what the enemy's deal is his number one goal is if he can't tempt you into sin is to distract you from making a difference in yourself and in the lives of your church and your community that's the goal and we need to be aware of that. And so it's a double-sided problem. We're not only spiritual sick with hurriedness in our culture, but we have a scheme actively outwork against us. And so the answer is to make room, is to create margin. And the number of way that one way that we can do that is to make room for God in our thoughts and what we think about him. You know, I think the foundational level of having a vibrant, growing relationship with God is to have the right narrative. To believe the right things about God. And there are situations and experiences in life and doctrines that we've come to believe and philosophies that we've come to accept that distort this view about God. For instance, if I suffer pain and evil, God hates me. If I've had a bad fatherhood experience uh, in my childhood, if my father was bad, God must be like that. I mean, we have all of these projections that we put on God, and we need to make room for God by giving him a chance to enter our minds and give us the thoughts, the right thoughts that we need to have about him. You know, in 1967, futurists told a Senate subcommittee that by 1985, thanks to technology, Americans would be working, and this is nice, right? Americans would be working on average 22 hours a week for 27 weeks a year, and the average person would retire at the age of 38. That's a joke, right? I mean, think about it. That is an absolute joke. They predicted that we would have too much time on our hands. But since 1973, leisure time in America has decreased by 37%. Think about that. 
Leisure time in America has decreased by 37% with all of our technology. Technology may have reduced the time that we spend on certain tasks, but we have used our time for other things. Why? We're spiritually sick with hurriedness, and Satan's schemes are working against us. In this book called The Good and Beautiful God, I'm reading it um, right now, I'm almost done, he put it like this. Will we take on too many things or be too concerned about the wrong things and thus miss the most important things? Distracted playing a video game and we miss our kids growing up. Distracted with work all the time. Again, work is good. It is a godly virtue. It is a spiritual discipline. But if we work all the time, we miss out on so many good things. If we have strapped ourselves so harsh financially that we can't afford to experience good things with our family, with our kids, and in our community. We're missing out. We've been distracted with the bad things or the wrong things, that we've missed the important things. And when it comes to the Bible, the Bible has a lot to say about our thoughts, about our minds. It makes it a priority, a doctrinal priority, in fact. There's this one story which Kyle told a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to get into it too much. It's Martha and Mary. Jesus enters their home. He's teaching them. Martha's all concerned. She's up doing all, she's so busy, moving on one thing to the next. She's got to prepare the food and get the table ready. And she looks over at her sister, and she starts to get mad because Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus learning. And uh, she starts to get frustrated. And finally, she explodes in anger, and she says, Jesus... Tell my sister to get up and help me do these tasks. This is ridiculous. I'm the only person working here. And Jesus responds, and he says, Martha, Martha. It's a double name. There's only seven of them in Scripture, and it's a rebuke. Martha, Martha. He says, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Martha, you're missing it. You're doing good things, but Mary's chosen great things. And look, this was something that was given to me. It's a, it's a word of wisdom, right? You're not always, parents, going to be able to have the mess totally cleaned up all the time. It's just impossible. My kids are monsters. My downstairs is destroyed, okay? It's, it's destroyed. I can't imagine what it's like to have three, four, and five kids. I mean, some of you parents are amazing people. I mean, you're just like, look, we're giving up our home for the next 18 years, whatever. But my kids, like, there's like the entire floor downstairs is covered with toys. There's stains on the wall and swipes from hands. I don't even want to take a guess what that's all about. Who knows what that is? I'm like, Lord Jesus, please let that be saliva or spit or something else. I'm just going to avoid it and act like it's not there. I'm kidding. I usually do try to clean it off on the wall. But I have repainted my house in the stairwell like 16 times already. I mean, but the reality is, is that I am not going to miss out on the great things to make sure the house is always clean all the time. Just not going to do it. I'm not missing out on the great things. And it's a good thing to have a clean house. I like to have a clean house. I try to have a clean house. But man, the good things, the great things at being with my kids and taking in that time. And you know what also is greater than cleaning? Sleep. <laughs> that is greater than cleaning. You know, it's funny, in The Good and Beautiful Life, the very first chapter, the number one practice that he encourages you to practice for the very first time is sleep. Think about it. We were created to sleep. Eight hours of our day. I mean, a third of our day, we're we're resting. It's part of our design. If you deprive yourself of sleep and you overload your schedule with hurriedness, you have set a terrible disaster, a recipe for disaster, for disconnection with God. One of the number one reasons why we don't have a vibrant, growing relationship with God is because we're exhausted. We're tired. We're impatient and angry because we're exhausted and we're tired. That's just the way it is. And we've we've got to correct that. So here's what he told you to do. Take one day a week and sleep as long as you want. And so, spouses, if you could give this gift to your spouse, say, hey, look, honey, I got the kids. I want you to take Saturday morning and sleep as long as you want, and I've got the kids. And if you can't do that, then try to take three days a week to at least get seven hours of sleep. At least. And I think you'll find yourself in a better position to experience God on a totally different level because now you're not exhausted But will we take on too many things or be too concerned about the wrong things and thus miss the most important things? And Jesus told Martha, Martha, you're missing the most important things. Yeah, these things are important, but you're sacrificing the good things. Or you're sacrificing the great things for the good things. And we just can't do that. You know, the Bible tells us in Matthew 22 to love God with our minds, with our thoughts. And if our thoughts are constantly bombarded with hurriedness a Netflix show, a social media, just constant entertainment, and we don't give ourselves time to think, 
We'll never be able to grow in that. Romans 12, 2, transform your mind. Well, that's an intentional process. Ephesians 4, be renewed in your mind. Colossians 3, 1 and 2, set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. Set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And if our mind isn't intentionally going there, then we won't think about God. You know, the Jews, they actually were told to put this scripture on the forefront of their minds. And they actually created these little boxes that they would wrap around their heads. And they, would, they took it literally rather than literarily. And they carried this rolled up scripture on the forefront of their minds. And that's tough, being intentional to think about certain things. If you have a sin that you want to overcome, for instance, you have to maintain that intentional thought in your mind. Don't go there. Don't think that. Because you're on alert. You're aware. If you see your schedule starting to fill up and you've intentionally blocked out time for God, you won't have that issue. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, whatever is pure and noble and holy, think on such things. When's the last time you sat down and thought about sexual purity? I'm going to take an hour to think about sex. And it's going to be exactly how God wanted me to picture it and view it. Most of our culture, they take hours, multiple times a day, to fill their minds with sexual impurity. But what about money? What about time? What about theology or philosophy? I mean, making room for God in your mind, intentional thinking, giving yourself a chance to grow with the Lord in your thoughts. One of my favorite passages of scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, where Paul says this, we take every thought captive. We take it captive. The idea is to overcome the resistance to the gospel. All right, so if there's something about God that I can't accept, or if there's something about the Bible that I can't accept, or if there's something in science that I'm struggling to accept, or philosophy, I need to take that thought captive by removing the obstacle so that I could accept truth. That's why I'm a Christian. The obstacle that I removed was Jesus didn't resurrect from the dead, or the Bible wasn't trustworthy and historically reliable, or God didn't create the earth. I mean, those were obstacles that I intellectually had to overcome. Well, that's exactly what we're supposed to do by taking thoughts captive. Here's literally what it means. Paul portrays himself as this military general who must breach a stronghold in case people start to flee the city. And so he breaches the stronghold, he overcomes the stronghold to capture the city. That's the same idea it is with taking thoughts captive. If I am spiritually sick with hurriedness, I need to take that stronghold captive and subject it to the lordship of Christ. It's a beautiful picture. Whether or not our hurriedness is intentionally or unintentionally getting between us and God, we need to create margin in our life and make room for God to move. And so here's what I want you to do this week. What can you do to make room for God? If you can't change your schedule immediately, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take one day to fast. Fast for one day, sunrise to sunset. So if you want to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and then wait until the sun goes down at 9 o'clock in the morning to eat, that's fine. But take one day to fast. Deprive yourself of food. And here's what I can tell you. Every time you get hungry, you're going to think about God. You're going to think about what you're going through. If you can do that, you can create room for God to work. Or fast and pray. If you could fast from food and then take an intentional moment, 5, 10, 15 minutes, an hour, to sit down with no distractions and pray. Even better, fast, pray, and prepare a slow day. I'm not going to go do anything. Next Saturday, we're going to chill in the house. We're going to bake. We're going to make food. We're going to watch TV. We're going to hang out, or even better, we're going to keep the TV off. No iPads, no iPhones. We're going to leave it on the charger. We're just going to have a slow day where we're going to connect with one another as a family, and we're just going to enjoy ourselves. That's what I want you to do this week. And if you can set this pattern up, to prepare yourself for success, here's what I want you to do. Take one hour a day, one day a week, one week in a month, and one week a year to disconnect from your hurriedness and connect with God. Because really, how love is spelled in our culture is T-I-M-E. It's our greatest commodity that we have, and it's the least commodity that we have available. And the reality is the most important aspects of our life cannot be rushed. And you want to talk about the most important aspect of your life. It's your relationship with God. Showing up on Sunday morning to hear a sermon is not going to get the job done. There has to be more, and it has to be intentional. And you know, when my children, um, the best time that they have is spending time. Do you know why they love to go to Clyde and Judy so much? It's not because they sit them down with an iPad 
or set them in a room to play with toys while they're on their phone hanging out, it's because they spend time with them. They go in the fort, they play outside, they go on the four-wheeler, they play trains, they spend time together, and they love it. And that's what I want. You know, when we're eating ice cream and building forts and hanging out with one another and playing with trains, my kids absolutely love it. It's the most important time in their lives. And you want to talk about your relationship with God as your heavenly father? God spells love like this, T-I-M-E. Spend time with the Lord. I'll end with this verse. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 says this. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, our God, is an everlasting rock. If you have found yourself with a spiritual sickness of hurriedness, and you don't really have a whole lot of peace in your life, my encouragement to you is to take some time to fix your mind on the Lord. And you'll get peace. And you'll have growth. And you'll connect with the Lord. Because what we cannot do is sacrifice excellence in our relationship with God for what we believe is effective because we're in a hurry. Now we're going to take a few moments to take the Lord's Supper. And so if you haven't had the opportunity yet, there's a travel communion in the basket at the back of the auditorium. And this is a time where we just take a few minutes out of our day to give God a chance to move, to remind ourselves that we are forgiven, that Jesus did die on the cross for us, that we, we have a relationship with him. And I know that we're, we'll be tempted to think about what's next and what's going on after church and we have to go get our kids and maybe we think about this past week and how we've messed up and we've sinned. But I want us to just listen to our space, our time, our music and get these thoughts out of our mind for two minutes and think about the cross. So as you take that bread, which is Jesus' body, and you break it, or you put it in your mouth and it, and it breaks between your teeth, I want you to remember that Jesus broke his body for you and for me. And then as you take that cup, which is Jesus' blood, and you drink it, I want you to think about, in your mind, picture Jesus on the cross and blood pouring forth from his hands and from his skull and from his back because he died on the cross for you and for me. He's worth thinking about. And let's do so over the next few minutes. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for who you are and how much you love us. And God, you made time for us. You came down on this earth and you lived for 33 years, living in a body just like ours so that you could understand who we are and what we go through, but most importantly, so that you could take our place on the cross. And God, I thank you for being all present and all knowing, being everywhere at once, that I don't have to go anywhere to access you or go through any other person that's sitting in a booth to talk to you. The Lord, I can come right to you because of your son, Jesus. I can talk to you right now. And I thank you for the time that we have together to read your word and look to the life of Jesus and live lives of courage, telling people no so that we can say yes to you. God, I pray that we will focus on the cross of Jesus and that we will picture what he did for us and remember that he did it so that we could have the forgiveness of our sins. We love you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.